بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم لا تعلم وتعليم وتذكر وتذكر والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحث على تمسكه بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى مع لطف وعافية برحمتك يا رحمة رحمة اللهم نسلك العلم لدني والمشرب السوفي الهني وهب يا غني اللهم نسلك العلم لدني والمشرب السوفي الهني وهب يا غني اللهم نسلك العلم لدني والمشرب السوفي الهني وهب يا غني صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين Alright, Alhamdulillah. Alright, so now uh, for today, we will be going on to the Battle of Khaybar. Alright, last time round, we took the uh, we took the uh, letters, or some sent by the different kings, right? I realized that the recording was not clear. For those of you who were, hear, who were hearing the recording, right, it was just not clear, and then it cut off halfway, I don't know why. Right, so it, uh, on my own time, I will do uh, redo the lesson now. Right, to be, to be recorded. I about we will be going on to middle of Khaybar, right? So Khaybar is basically a place, right? It's a place of fortress. And I mentioned before that I was mentioning this. I was using this word previously, right? For the battle of uh, against the Bani Khuraida, right? So it, uh, basically uh, because they were they, both of the battles had something to do with the battle of a trench, right? So I think I I used the wrong word, right? For uh, battle against Bani Khuraida. Right, Middle Khaybar. Middle Khaybar happened later on, right? And the Battle of Bani Khuraida happened right after the Battle of the Trench, right? Battle of Khaybar also happened with result in 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 response to the Battle of the Trench, right? So what happened was that when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was uh when when the disbelievers came right to fight Rasulullah sallam in the Battle of the Trench, right? And we know that you know they came in large numbers, right? Uh, the 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 main instigators. Right, so the instigators, eh? The main instigators right, for the Battle of the Trench. We went through the Battle of the Trench in detail, and the main instigators are the Jews, right, the Jews of Khaybar, and the Jews of Khaybar. Khaybar is basically a town, right, a fortress, right? That is quite uh, a bit far, right, from from Medina, about ninety three miles from Medina, right? So, and these were the banished Jews of Bani Qainuqa and Bani An Nadir. I remember they were banished, right, from 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 before. Right, uh, for Bani Quraida, they were uh, killed. Right, they were killed off because of the treachery against Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in times of war. Right, we learned about them during the Battle of uh, Battle of Khandaq, right, the Battle of the Trench. So these Jews, right, who form basically they form the, the the town of Khaybar. Right, they were the ones who went to the Quraysh, right, and they also went to the Ghatafan. Right, if you remember, it's all all these names are all around. Eh? <laughs> like Ghatafan. Right, Ghatafan is. So I'm trying to like keep recapping you know, who these people are. Right, Ghatafan is one of the major tribes, right, that uh gave numbers, right, to the Quraysh army, right, to fight Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Battle of the Trench. Right, I'm gonna try to also to use the English word eh, instead of saying Khandak Khandak. <laughs> right, Khandak means trench. Right, so Battle of Khandak, right, Battle of the Trench. Right, so it um so it so so they were also the ones, right, Battle of Khandak, Battle of the Trench, Battle of uh the uh uh the ahzab all the same thing okay they're all the same right ahzab khandaq trench right ahzab basically the confederates right because they, they ganged up right and then they, they had huge numbers and they went against Rasulullah so on so right the, so basically the, the jews were the main instigators right they went to uh, to, to, to mecca right they began to speak to the arabs there saying that you know we have numbers we have you know people Right, you know, rally up your people. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, in a sense, we're gonna uh, destroy the Muslims in Medina. We're gonna march up to them and destroy them. Right, and then even the Ghatafan, which is a tribe near uh, Mecca, and also the Ghatafan, they showed a lot of animosity towards the Muslims. So they were, I mean, and they are very much, uh, they were, they were, they were Bedouins uh, in the desert, right? And they were very much uh, hostile towards the Muslims, and they also wanted money. Right, so the Jews of uh, Khaybar, right, they have a lot of uh, wealth, right, and they have a lot of plantations, a lot of whatsoever, right. So they entice these people by saying, "Oh, we'll give you half of our produce, right, of next year if you come and fight, uh, fight uh, Muhammad with us." Right, so that's how they rally up the people. All this while, after the Battle of the Trench, 
Rasulullah SAW has been very occupied with the uh, Quraysh and uh, always uh, being a threat onto Medina. So now that the Treaty of Hudaybiyah has been signed, right, and there's no more, uh, you know, fighting between Rasulullah SAW and the Quraysh, right, now he can finally, right, turn towards Khaybar. So this Khaybar uh, battle is actually very much delayed, right? The cause of this battle was actually the, the, the trench, right? Because they were the instigators and they rallied up the people to fight the Muslims. So therefore, they are a very dangerous threat that is near Al Madinah, right? So remember, we were into the second part of the Sira, right? We're talking a lot about war strategies. We're talking about you know uh, dangers around Medina. When the, the, the Muslims are now a society, as a community, right? And they have they have enemies around them. Right, they are waiting to destroy the the, the, the believers. Right, so you see, when when they wage war, right, they are seeing you know a possible uh, it's basically a possible uh, a threat. Right, on one side, they can attack Al Medina. Right, so these Jews of Khaybar, because they did the instigation, right, and they rallied up the, the forces to fight the Muslims. And had it not been right for Sayyidina Salman's idea of building a trench, right, and had it not been for of course Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's help. Right, thereafter in sending you know the winds and, and of course Allah made someone a Muslim right which which foiled all of their plans. Right, had it all not been that you I mean, if you look at it physically, right, what the Jews did right, in rallying up, you know, about how ten thousand people more than that, right, to, to destroy people of Medina, that would have been really detrimental. Right? That, that was a serious thing that they all did, right, to, to destroy the people of Medina once and for all. Right. So they are a, a real threat. And this is a real threat right, to the side of Al Medina. So, so this this battle is basically a very a really overdue battle, right? It was it was supposed to be right after the trench, uh, because of being so you know uh, uh, caught up with the Quraysh. Rasulullah never had the the, the chance to actually uh, retaliate right, against the Jews, right? Who actually caused the battle of the trench. Right, so you see how this battle is coming in, eh? Battle of Khaybar, how it's coming in, right? So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, he gathers the people right after Hudaybiyah, right, and they march uh, thereafter. Sometime thereafter, they march to Khaybar, right. And only the people who followed Rasulullah to Hudaybiyah, right, they, they were the only ones who were march who were allowed to march to Khaybar, right, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in the Quran, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reveals here, right, in Surah Fath, right, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reveals, Allah has promised you many gains that you shall acquire. And he has given you these beforehand, and he has restrained the hands of men from you, that it may be a sign for the believers, and that he may guide you to a straight path. Right? This is the, basically Allah's promise on the Rasulullah Sallam, right? For the victory over Khaybar, right? They will win over Khaybar, and these Jews, even though they were banished and they, they formed their own forces elsewhere, it's called Khaybar. They became rich very quickly. <laughs> right? So they have a lot of wealth. Right, still, you know, so wherever they go, they they they, they are money makers. Uh, right? So wherever they go, they make they build wealth, they build wealth, they build wealth. Allah you know, I mean, Allah is something that Allah Subhanahu has uh, tested them with by giving them uh, wealth. Right, so those who stayed behind, right, during uh, Hudaybiyah, didn't follow them for Hudaybiyah. Right, they were not allowed to come. They actually wanted to come, right, because they wanted the booty, right, of the world. They know Khaybar is rich, right, has a lot of plantations, a lot of crops. Right, the, the, the Jews there are rich, right? So the the munafiq, right? The hypocrites, right? They want now they want in la, They want to follow, right? Uh, in the battle, so they always appear when the money when money is involved. <laughs> money when they appear, right? Whenever you have to fight, they disappear. Right? So the, the, it's the case of the munafiq la, right? It's basically what they are. So but Allah sent the commandment, right? Those who remain behind will say, when you set out to the war booty, right? To take it, they say, let us follow you. Right, they wish to change the words of Allah, say, never will you follow us. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say before. Right? Allah said this, that you will not follow us, oh, oh uh, hypocrites. And they will say, oh, you envy us. Right? But they don't understand anything, right? These hypocrites. Right? So they, they, subhanahu wa ta'ala, they don't allow them to go, right? except for those who went with him to, uh, to, to, to Khaybar. Right? So now, before approaching Khaybar, and, and the thing is that, Right, Rasulullah's march to Khaybar right, was supposed to be, you know, he's, he's not supposed to be told. Right, but of course, among the hypocrites, right, and you have Abdullah bin Ubay, who is the chief of the hypocrites. Right, so his name should ring a bell, eh? Abdullah bin Ubay. Right, basically, hypocrite. Right, he's the chief of the hypocrites. Right, he sends a message to the Jews at Khaybar. 
of course like they would <laughs> they're all allies <laughs> he says that Jesus in Khaybar and warns him of the coming of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Muslim troops right so the Jews you know they sent a message to Ghattafan and Ghattafan is a tribe right that is near Khaybar right so Ghattafan the, 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 um, the Bedouins they actually helped a lot right in uh, fighting Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa during the battle of the trench right? right they were the ones they were the ones who like uh they were the ones whereby you know the story whereby one of the men became Muslim, right? He was from Bethlehem. Uh, and then and, and his tribe, uh, so so basically it was them where you know can't trust the Jews and the Jews can trust them and whatsoever. It was them, right? the same same people, the Ghattafan. And they fled first. And then when they fled, right, the Quraysh were like, what's going on, right? The Ghattafan fled. So they all fled, right? So then the whole thing got you know and, uh, got left, right, this bandit. Right, so that's that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's planning. So the Jews send the send word to Ghatafan saying that oh Muhammad and the troops are coming, right? Muhammad and his uh, people are coming uh to to fight us. I right? send your troops and we promise you half the years of harvest, right? That's the, always their their cut eh. <laughs> they cut same cut, right? Money, right? You come and do for us, we will give you money. Right, we are, I, I'm skipping here and there, sorry. <laughs> They're jumping here and there. Right, the one is it on. The one is it on. I will, I will point it out when I get there. Right, so, it, uh, uh, so, so Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so, 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 they agree. It's a lot of fun. They all, it's all about money, lah. Eh? Right, so they agree and they march out, you know, but as they were marching out, they heard some sounds uh, in their own uh, village, right, in their own town. And they they had fear that it was the Muslims that had come to uh, attack their village, right? So they went back uh, out of fear, and they abandoned what the Jews said, uh, you know, called them to. And it wasn't the Muslims; it was just some sound they heard. Right? But Allah Subhanahu wa struck uh, fear into their hearts, right? and then brought them back. So easy for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. No, 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 right now, right now, right now. Oh, right, now. right now, right now, they were supposed to actually called in by the Jews, but then they they, they abandoned the Jews. And the thing about it, you know, that we, there is this like study whereby you know when people are being paid. They don't do as if those who are not being paid, <laughs> right? It's actually you know it's interesting. It's, it's, it's a human psychology, you know. The Sahaba, right? At this point, and they're all not being paid. Of course, they get the war booty and whatsoever, right? Right? But you know, uh, there's still promise, right? That you will get the booty because you have to win and you get the booty, right? Right? But there is there, there was a study before that they did you know when people do their odd jobs, right? Like when you do things you know just to help, right? Uh, you should do more. Right, then if you are paid, if you are paid and the small and the amount is small, right, you be like you do the, the amount that you are given, <laughs> right, and then war oh, that can be detrimental, right, because like you know you're like oh I only paid this amount, you know, <laughs> I mean the ikhlas is not there lah, because the ikhlas can really make a person. I I don't know which other kind of red lah, but but it was more of like you know when like I said when when the neighbors come out to help you move things, you know, and then you give them like you know small like money. Uh, amount of money, right, cash. You actually, in a sense, uh, you 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 ruin it for them. <laughs> you actually ruin it for them. If you want to like, you know, like show your appreciation and give, like, you know, maybe some some food or like brownies, which is not like it's not a payment. Because uh, when you give like a payment, then they begin to weigh how much they did and like, oh, all that for five dollars. They kind of thing, you know, like <laughs> it actually is a human psychology thing, right? So they they were like, it's not worth it. They kind of thing. Right, but the, the the Sahaba, because it's, there's no payment. Right? It's, of course, if it's, it's in the next world, the hereafter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, and that's why they, the way they fight, right? It's like never like the, the the disbelievers cannot they can't fight that, and they can't fight that because they are they are they are motivated by akhirah gains, and the disbelievers are motivated by dunya we gains. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself says in the Quran, right? These people they are doing it for Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and those people they are doing it for shaitan. Right, so their motives are very weak. Right, okay, we're on page uh, 168. If you wonder where I am, <laughs> 168. I'm jumping around. Right, so so I want to read his message to the Jews of Khaybar, and be, and basically this is uh, what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed to Rasulullah Sallam about the Jews. The Prophet's message to the Jews of Khaybar. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had written to the Jews of Khaybar a letter that invited them to believe in him, which read. In the name of Allah, the most merciful, the compassionate, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. From Muhammad, the messenger of God, Allahu alayhi wa sallam, the companion of Musa and his brother. Right, so now he, you see how he writes, eh? he always 
addresses what the people understand. Uh, we are the same, and you all know uh, I am the same as Musa and Harun. We are all prophets, uh, and you're fighting a prophet in that you're fighting me, right? So and and from and from the one who believes in what Musa preached, right? And the Rasul of himself, right? He believes in uh, the one who believes in what Musa preached. For surely Allah has said to you, O people of the Torah, right? In the Quran, Allah has mentioned, O people of the Torah. And very you find such in your book, Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah, the Apostle of Allah, and those who are with him are strong against unbelievers, compassionate amongst themselves. You will see them bow and prostrate themselves in prayer, seeking grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his good pleasure. On their faces are the marks and traces of their prostration, you know, the light of prostration. Uh, this is their similitude in the Torah. And the similitude in the gospel is like a seed which sends forth its blade, then makes it strong, it then becomes thick, and it stands on its own stem, filling the the, the sowers with wonder and delight. As a result, it fills the, the it fills the unbelievers with rage at them. Allah has promised those who believe and do righteous deeds, forgiveness and a great reward. Right, so he quotes in the Quran first, Rasulullah Sallallahu in Surah Fatih, right, verse 48. Right, he quotes in the Quran first, right, reminding the Jews right, that we are all on the same page. Right, you know, we are also people who believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Right, and Rasulullah also says, I also believe in Musa as you all believe in Musa. Right, we believe that he's a prophet and he's a noble man. Right, and that he brought you the Torah and we believe in the Torah as well. You know, as Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, we believe in all revealed books. And we also believe in the Torah, right? And also, right, that they know their religion in bowing and prostrating, right? In their religion, they have prayer also. It's very much like in Islam. It's very similar, right? The way they pray right? and the way they have their laws, right? In fact, you know, as mentioned, that the laws of the Jews are more strict, and on the on the laws of the uh, the Muslims, right? And then you know, and and uh, so so and that all of these things, right? Will be you will you will find the fruits of it. Right, in the hereafter, and we are both people who believe in the hereafter. Right, the Jews never uh, disbelieve in the hereafter. And right, the Jews are believers in the hereafter, but their belief in the hereafter is all oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran is uh, messed up. <laughs> it's a skewed belief in the hereafter, whereby in Surah Baqarah Allah subhanahu wa says, right, and the Jews claim right, that they will only enter the fire for a while, right, and then they will all be brought out of the fire. And the Jews claim that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to them, then okay, then then ask then then, then um, bring your proof, ask for death. Right? If that's if that's really what's gonna happen to you, right, then you're only gonna be dipped in the fire for a while. And even us as believers, we, we also know that you know believers eventually enter into the into paradise. But nobody wants you to be dipped into the fire even for a while. Even for a split second, you don't want to be dipped into the fire, right? It's not it's not uh, delightful. Eh? <laughs> right? It's not it's not something that you can actually handle. Right? So but the Jews they say in the Quran, we'll be in the fire for a while, then we come out. In Surah Baqarah, in Surah Baqarah also they said that in the in in they said in uh, Allah quotes them and they say right, that no one will enter paradise except Jews and Christians, right? And Allah says that is their wish, is their wishful thinking. <laughs> Allah says well, this in the Quran, right? it's just wishful thinking from them, right? So so they are believers in the hereafter, and right? they are definitely believers in the hereafter, right? But they have you know uh, skewed ideas of what's going to happen in the hereafter. Right, then so he says this to the Jews to remind them. And he says, I beseech you by God and that which has been which has been revealed to you, and I beseech you by the one who fed those of your tribe before you, Manna and Salwa. I also from Surah Baqarah where Allah Subhanahu sent food from paradise down to the Jews. Right, manna wa salwa. And I beseech you by the one who made solid the sea for your forefathers, so that he saved them from uh, Fir'aun and his deeds. Right, how Allah subhanahu split the sea and made the mountains by the side and you all walk through. Right, so that Rasulullah so is is reminding the Jews of all of Allah's favors upon them. And this prophet coming to them, the last prophet, and that they have met the last prophet, is another one of Allah subhanahu favors. So don't be ungrateful here and try to kill this <coughs> prophet as how the Jews have killed the prophets from before. Right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned many times. Right, they, they have killed other prophets before you. Right, and they have this. They have, they have lied against the prophets. They have denied the prophets. Right, it's something they they, they they have done from before, and they will continue to do it. 
and true enough they continue to kill or to, to try and uh kill or some awesome. it was during this battle that some got poisoned eh? i feel the story of him getting poisoned by the meat uh it was this battle right the battle of Khaiba, right uh but not really fully poisoned but the, the a bit of the poison entered into his uh into his uh body which later on uh before his death right so Wasallam, he says that he can feel the poison of Khaiba. Right, the poison. So the 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 poison meat lah, right? The woman who would uh, put, uh injected into the. But then this is still um, this is the eighty, right? Yes. So two years. So the poison the basically stayed in his body for about two years. Yeah, it stayed in his body for about two years. It was a very small amount, right? But of course, Allah didn't allow the poison to have to take place until it was time for him to pass away, right? So even then, you know, Allah controls when the poison will have effect. <laughs> Right, Allah controls it. How Allah controls the fire for Nabi Ibrahim. Right, Allah controls the, 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 the knife for Nabi Ismail. Allah controls the waters for Nabi Musa. Right, Allah controls the point for Rasulullah also. It's not, it's, not a big, uh, it's not a big deal for Rasulullah. Right, he could have eaten the entire meat, you know, for all it is. <laughs> if Allah doesn't want, to, doesn't want to allow the poison to take place, it will not have any effect whatsoever. It's a lot of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah just... She Allah shows us his powers. <coughs> right. So so he says, you know, and the, uh, and then he says, and you make me and you tell me truthfully, do you find in what Allah revealed to you that you must believe in Muhammad? Right. So now he's reminding the Jews, right? Let's not fight. Right? Because I mean they wish war against him first, right? So do you find anything that you must believe in Muhammad? If you do not find that in your book, then there is no compulsion upon you for guidance has been made clear from going astray. So I call you to Allah and His Prophet. Right? And Rasulullah knows that it is definitely in their book. Right? He knows it. Allah has informed him. Right? It is in their Torah. And in fact, they had preserved it right up to the point when they saw Rasulullah SAW, then they changed it. Right, so they they kept it, they kept it all the way because they were all looking for the last prophet, right? So only when they saw him and they realized, oh, this one, <laughs> right? And then they changed everything. And then Surah Bayna, right? Surah Bayna, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, Islam yang kita lihat nak kafiru min ahli kitab wal mushkina, mufakina, hatta taatiyahum al bayna. Rasulul Milaahi asal sufa mutahara, right? Fiha kutubu qaydima. Right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Bayina, right, that the people of the, the disbelievers and the people of the book, they will not be in, uh, they, will, they will not be broken apart. That means they were all united until the clear proof came to them. And what's the clear proof? The Prophet. Right, they were all together, you know, they, were not, they, were, they were not separated, they were not you know, uh, arguing whatsoever, they were all together waiting for the last Prophet to come. Then when the Prophet came, or oh, then. Right, then they began to uh, break apart right, because some of them believe, some of them disbelieve and right, those who believe know and those who disbelieve right, they, are, they are lying they are lying and changing so for example of Sayyidina Abdullah bin, bin, bin Salam and Sayyidina Abdullah bin Salam the, the Jewish rabbi right, uh, he was one of those right, who told Islam that yeah, Rasulullah right, they are lying, they are changing stuff I memorize the Torah, I know what's in there <laughs> right, and you know, if you look at uh, Murad Diba'i Right, as a part of all the Jewish, uh, all the Muslims who became Jew thereafter, also said, right, that 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 uh, her, that his father taught him everything in the Torah, except for some uh, pages that he kept in a box that he never allowed anyone to look at, right. But after the father passed away, they opened the box and they found that in it are the descriptions of the last prophet, right. And then when he met Rasulullah, he saw they were exactly as what he found in his father's box, right. It was kept away. Right, and later on, we will speak about the, the, the marriage of Rasulullah to Sayyidina Sophia bin Dihayyat. And she was uh, of the Jews. And she came, came into Islam. And she herself also will tell Rasulullah SAW because both her father and her uncle were uh, very knowledgeable right, in the Torah. So she knew you know, of what they said and what they saw. Right, so she knew that all oh, <laughs> is lying. Right, so there were a lot of the Jews who she told Rasulullah SAW that, yep, it is in their book. Right, definitely in their book. So Rasulullah SAW, he, he, he marched out to Khaybar, it's quite a distance away, right? And uh, uh, there are a few lines of poetry here you see in your book. And the thing is that the Arabs in the past, right, they would always sing to their camels. Interesting thing they, they used to do, right? Because when camels, when, you, when camels were being sung to, they actually have more energy. And they walk faster. 
Uh, and then they 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 are the, so so cute. Okay, what's that? And then they are pacing will be with the with the pacing of the song. Uh, so so when they when they upbeat the song, they can move much faster. Okay, <laughs> uh, so oh wow, well, you know, so the Arabs know about it. Then they have so basically in most caravans, they'll have one person as the camel singer. Uh, a singer for the camel, so they will just, uh, just sing, sing, and the camel will just <laughs> right, and go and go very quickly and, and not don't get tired. Eh? So that, when the tired, camel get the camel gets very like you know tired and the journey, they will sing, and the camel is like energy comes up, <laughs> and then he means so much more. Right, so the verse that they were actually singing, right, uh, Amr the poet, right, he says, you know, oh God, we're not for you, we would not have been guided, nor would have, no would we have been, no would we have given alms and zakat. No, we have prayed. Forgive us. We sacrifice ourselves to you. What is left of our sin, and make our feet steadfast. And when we meet the enemy, and send down upon us serenity, and we are called to do, uh, when we are called to wrong, we decline. Right. So, in another narration, Allah, but for you, but for you, we would not have been guided, not been arms, or no, would we have prayed? That like we are in need of your blessings. Make firm our feet when we are met. Right, with our enemies, center quality down upon us. Right, so this person he has a very good voice and a very good uh, a camel singing voice. And even then, they had a, they had a tradition whereby the camel singer had a good voice that the camels liked. Right, so it's not for the human beings, but for the camels to actually enjoy right, the, what the human beings sung. <laughs> right, so he was singing, right, and Rasulullah Sallam said to him, uh, Rasulullah Sallam said to him, uh, may Allah have mercy on him. And right, whenever Rasulullah Sallam says to anyone, that would mean that that person is going to face death soon. Uh, so Sayyidina Omar, when he heard Rasulullah say, we all have mercy on the camel singer, a leader of the tribe. <coughs> and Sayyidina Omar said to Rasulullah Sallam, Ya Rasulullah, if only you had left him so he could enjoy him a bit more. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right, but basically he'll be martyred. Right? So it's not that Rasulullah caused him to die, right? but it's more like he knew that uh, this man will be martyred in the battle. And in, true enough, in this battle, he got martyred. Right? He got killed in this uh, battle. Right, so uh, they went, uh, and one of the interesting things about the battle is that so they, if you can see in the book, there's this entire path going on from Al Madina, how they marched forth, right, to Khaybar. Right, so Khaybar, and, and they wanted to, to march from the north, right, so Medina is here, Khaybar is north, right, and then Sham is further up, right, so they wanted to come in from here, right, so as to prevent the Jews from fleeing to Sham. I think to see it, right? So they took, you see, they took an entire one uh, round around it, right? So and along the way, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, uh, he they reach a fork in the road, and right? they have some guides to bring them to Khaybar, and right? they reach a fork, fork in the road, right? And there were like I think there were about three or four uh, forks, right? There were like one, two, three, four, right? Four forks in the road, right? So it, uh, so so the the, the the guide said. All of them will bring us to Khaybar at equal time. Right, they're all the same. Right, and Rasulullah said, okay, tell me their names. Right, and it was, Rasulullah was known to love good names. Right, good names, blessed names. And then it is a sunnah for us that if you were to name anything, right, to make it good and blessed. Right, try not to use uh, difficult or you know, uh, negative you know, names for, for, for things. Right, especially for people. Right, people or for houses or for... You know, uh, anything like that you that you name, right? I can I was thinking just now that I don't know, like sometimes people they they they, they like to name uh, children nicknames, right? Which is not very sometimes it's not very pleasant, the nicknames, right? So then it becomes a a, a dua, right, for that person, right? So of the 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 past that they had there, right? The the, the leader said or the guide said, right? This path is called hazan, right? hazan meaning like like depression or difficulty. Mm-hmm. Right, another path it means uh, it means a shahesh, which means confusing. Another path it means a halib, right, which means woodcutter. Right, maybe it cuts off the wood. Allahu alam. Right, and for each of them, Rasulullah said, "Don't take it, don't take it, take it." Right, because it's, it all has bad names. Right, this take all these paths with bad names. And finally, they came to the one, and the last path that he said his name is marhab. Right, marhab, marhaban. I right? welcome. Right, Rasulullah said, "Okay, we take that one." And Sayyidina so Omar said to the, to the guy, why didn't you start the one in the first place? Mm-hmm. And why didn't you go one whole round, that's all the other names, it does, that's the marham last. <laughs> Should you sit on first, right? You know, waste our time. <laughs> right, so, so they went through, right, anyway, they went through. 
so they, they went through a marhab right and they took uh, down to the uh, fortresses okay the little high bar actually took a long time right they went from fortress to fortress right trying to uh, uh, basically uh, conquer right Khaybar. I won't go through every single fort, right? The book they will write about every single the fight of every single fort, right? But I'll just go through uh, one of them, right? Which is uh, the first one, right? The first one everybody had problems with, which was the one that Sayyidina Ali actually conquered, right? So Rasulullah Sallam he took that path, right? He went there, and he took that path, and he arrived at Khaybar at night, and it is his method that if he arrived at a place at night, he will not strike, and he'll wait till the morning. Right, in the morning he'll pray subuh first and then he will uh, strike right, khaybar. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and there is one story here about this man called Tufail bin al-Haris al-Khuzai, right, who was a believer who was following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, and Rasulullah said to him, Go back to your people and call them, right, for reinforcement. Right, and this to fail, right, so in the Tufail, he said, Ya Rasulullah, I will you send me away from you? Right, by Allah, I want to die near you. He knew he was going to die soon. Right? I want to die near you. Right, because it's more believable to me than to live a life far from you. And Rasulullah says that there is no avoiding what must be. So go. That right, means you still have to go. I right? call your people for reinforcement. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I think I might not see you again. Right, because you know, he feels that he's going to die soon. Right, so give me something that I can live by. Right? And when you hear that kind of uh, you know, words, you think that he wants something physical. From Rasulullah SAW for him to hold on to. But Rasulullah gave him advice. <laughs> and Rasulullah said that, Do you control your tongue? Right? And he said that, What do I control if I do not control my tongue? And of course, I, con- you know, I have to control my tongue. Then Rasulullah says, Are you a master of your hand? Then he says, If I'm not a master of my hand, then what else am I a master of? Right? So I am a master of my hand. Then Rasulullah says, and Do not say with your tongue anything but what is good. And do not do anything with your hand except what is good. And so you give this man advice, but go back to your people and send reinforcement. Right? But guard your tongue and guard your hand. Spread greetings and peace. Be generous with food and be ashamed of doing wrong in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As you would be ashamed of doing wrong in front of a pious person amongst your people. And this, and this, see, this advice is from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And if you can't feel shame doing wrong for Allah subhanahu wa taala, then imagine right, if a hababa is there, or a habib is there, or someone of righteousness is there, and right, would you do that right, in front of them? And if you do, if you won't do it, then don't do it in front of Allah subhanahu wa taala. Then he says, let your character be honorable and moral, and if you do wrong, do good. For good deeds eliminate the bad. Uh, if you fall into wrong deeds, right, then follow up with good deeds. So That's one of the advice Rasulullah has given to several Sahaba, right? You know, what's the asayyata hasana tamuhuha, right? And follow up uh, a bad deed with a good deed, you will wipe it out. Right? So that is what we are supposed to do also, right? Whenever you fall into bad deeds, follow it up with good deeds, right? Inshallah. All right. So he he marches off to the first. Fortress of Khaybar. If you look at your map, you see that there are like a lot of fortresses. Eh? Right? So you see that you know Sumran, Al Zubair, Al Niza, Al Salalim, Al Wa Al Wa Al Wadih, Al Sam, Al Naim, Al Naim. Right? So you see that like, there are like all these fortresses in you know, Obey, Al Qamus, and so on. And right? they have all these fortresses in, you know, in Khaybar. Right? Basically, every tribe makes their own fortress. Alright, so Rasul went for to each and every one of the fortresses and then he conquered. I'm just gonna to go to the first one. So the first one, Rasulullah he fought, right? But you know at that point he was having a migraine and he was not, he was not feeling very well. Alright, so he would send the Sahaba one by one, right, to lead the fighting. So he first sent Sayyidina, uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, right, to lead the fighting when he came back not having opened up the uh, fortress. I mean, not having conquered the fortress. Then he sent Sayyidina Omar and Sayyidina Omar same thing came back, not victorious. Right, so it was this. It was this situation whereby Rasulullah Sallam says, you know, in a hadith, "I will give this flag tomorrow to a man who loves Allah and His Prophet." I mentioned the story before to you, eh, in the other uh, narration, right? So that I mixed it up. Right, so it's here, right? And who is loved by Allah and His Prophet, and Sayyidina Ali, so on, eh? and Allah will give, uh, will grant us conquest right, or victory by this man's hands. He is not a deserter, and he will help you gain access. To the killer right, of your brother. Basically, there was a believer 
right? Mah- uh, Muhammad bin Maslama, his brother Mahmud bin Maslama was killed by somebody in Khaybar, right? So, so or some say that he will give you access to the killer of your brother, right? So everybody went to their to, to bed that night thinking, you know, who will be the the one who will be given the flag, right? who will be given the flag, right? And and you know, and Sayyidina Omar he narrates that I never wanted any form of leadership. Except that day, right? Because of what was said about the person who will be given the flag that that you know he loves Allah and the Rasulullah, and that Allah Rasulullah loves him, right? So Sayyidina Omar is he so he said that you know when we, when we all came, uh, to 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 meet Rasulullah Rasulullah, Sayyidina Omar said that you know he tried to you know make himself taller, right? You know like he's probably on his tiptoe, so he will he will see me, you know he will call me out, you know in, you know in case it's me, <laughs> right? So he would you know he did that. But Rasul looked around and he asked, "Where is Ali bin Abi Talib?" And then Ali was not there, right, because he had like his sort of sore eyes. And his eyes ill him. So you see, even when they go out to battle, they're all sick. <laughs> right, they have afflictions, they have sickness. Rasul had migraine. Rasul and Ali had sore eyes. Like you know, like they have like it's still afflicted by by diseases, by by sickness. So don't think like they're all out there in battle and they're all like you know all fit and ready to go. <laughs> And they all they have certain have fever. There's actually a story in in Zbatul Haiba where the Sahaba all got fever, right? One by one got fever. <laughs> so it's human. They're human beings. And you're out there in the desert. It's 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 winter. It's cold, right? It's you know the conditions are not right, right? In a way, so they're all afflicted right, by a lot of things. Right? So I don't think that when they go and fight, like they are very fit. Like for us, you know, like we we are sick a bit only like don't go to work. I cannot go to work. I cannot go out. I cannot go to class. I cannot go this. I cannot go that. Right? Because sick. Right? Sick. And they all jihad. Jihad lah. <laughs> right? So the fever also go for jihad. So I also go for jihad. You know, my also go for jihad. Right? It's like they just get up and go. Right? It's not a big deal for them. <laughs> right? For us, we just make it such a big deal. Eh? <laughs> right? Why? We don't know when we fall sick. No, Allah wa Alam. You know, sometimes we wonder these people of the past that like, they they don't see sickness as as something that stops them. And from only when they're really really sick and they can't get up, then they don't get up. And but otherwise, they they would do so go. And some of them will will try to go even though they are like you know they they are severely wounded or injured or even some of them can't see and they still want to go. And they can't they're blind and still want to go. Right for jihad. This is jihad. Eh? It's not. <laughs> It's not something easy. It's jihad, right? So Rasulullah said, "Call him and bring him here. Send for him and bring him to me." I answered. Now Ali has a sort of infection in his eyes, so he stayed away from the march for that reason, right? Uh, but Rasulullah called him, right? and Rasulullah spat into his eyes and prayed for him, right? And he says, "Oh Allah, remove from him the cold and the heat." Right? And when he was cured, as though he had no pain at all. And he said that never again had he any eye infection or headache since Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spat in his eyes, and he would wear summer clothes in the winter and winter clothes in the summer, and he wouldn't care about heat or cold. Right? So in Ali thereafter never felt cold or hot, ever, ever. And so he he just didn't care, right? Because Rasulullah made dua for him that Allah uh, remove him from cold and heat, so he never felt it. So in Fatima Zara also there was one time when she was very thirsty. Right, he couldn't find water. And Rasulullah made du'a because he saw her in uh, suffering, so he made du'a, Ya Allah, never let Fatima feel thirst. And then thereafter, she never felt thirst. It's not a story that one really tells. <laughs> it's not a story that in Sayyidina Musa, Sayyidina Musa, a biography. Right, she actually of the her khususiyat, right, of what she's special about. She never felt thirst. Right, she was never thirsty. And when du'a of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made du'a for her. Right, so it, uh, and I think there's another narration about never being hungry. So she never felt hunger. I so think she didn't eat and didn't drink, but never felt this, this, no hunger from a dua of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And mashallah, it is this one dua. This one dua. A lot of the Sahaba, whenever they get this dua from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they say, Anas Malik, Rasulullah made dua, you know, that Allah increased him in his progeny, and he met a hundred of his own offspring. Right, offspring meaning his great children and grandchildren. Right, so Anas bin Malik, you know, subhanAllah, if, if we could just even meet, you know, like ten, you know, or twenty of our offspring. <laughs> right, well, he met a hundred right, of his offspring. Subhanallah. Right, and of course, Rasul made dua for him long life, so he lived past a hundred. And Rasul made dua for Zainal Anas also for barakah and his wealth. Right, and his uh his his plants or his plantations would fruit twice a year, while everybody else would fruit once a year. 
is before GMO and before you know like you know any of these like, scientific you know uh, you were saying uh, influences eh right or intrusions. I say that Allah says Allah gave is a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa taala. I all from the du'a of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I mean, we say that Allah told Allah anhu. Right then, uh, I say that Allah basically you know this is Allah's du'a right. So in Anas, also made his du'a, and also made, and the du'a ends off with, uh, and may he be all the people of paradise, so we got the paradise. Right? So in Anas, in his old age, would say, you know, I saw, you know, of the du'a that was made for me, I saw all of them come true, and I only hope the last one will come true too. Right? The one about paradise. <laughs> I only hope that that too right, will come true. Because all of it came true, right, in his lifetime. Right? So then, uh, so then, then he gave Sayyidina Ali the, uh, the flag, and he says to Sayyidina Ali, go forth and do not turn left or right until Allah opens up the fortress for you. Sayyidina Ali, he marches on forth. Right? You find this, this hadith in the Rasulihin. Right? He marches on forth. Right? And because he's so obedient to Rasulullah wasallam, you know, he took a few steps, then he had a question. <laughs> uh, because Allah says, no, go forth and don't turn. Don't turn left or right. Don't turn back. Right? But go forth. Right? So he was so obedient that he, he walked to a few steps and he stopped. Then he called out to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So he can't, he can't turn around. <laughs> right, so he called out by facing front. Ya Rasulullah, what am I fighting them for? I right, mean, means, um, and until what do I fight them? Right, do I fight them until they all die, or, or what? You know, what until what until when do I fight them? Right, so he fight them until they say La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. Right, so once you testify this, then their blood and their money become haram on you. And they are held accountable by Allah alone, right? So, until they become believers, right? This is basically f- of uh, this hadith, right? Not to misunderstand it, is basically for people who are uh, at war with the Muslims, right? They are they are called kafir al harbi, right? They are these believers who are fighting the believers, right? They are not the same as these believers who are at peace with the believers. For these believers who are at peace with the believers in a, in a land of believers. For them is the tax, and right? they actually pay tax, right? The still land on the believers, right? And but the believers pay more. They pay zakat actually. <laughs> it is more the tax that actually the the, the, the these believers pay, right? Uh, and, uh, so it's not like you say you know that, that, that Islam kills people until they become Muslim, and that's not true, right? They fight them because these people are a threat. You must understand that they are a threat. If you don't kill them, they will kill you, right? So 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 they are basically kafir harbi. Right, they are they are they are these believers who are they, they they are at war with you. Right? So either they enter into Islam or they will kill you. Right? So you fight them, you know, before they actually kill you. Right. So Sayyidina Ali right, 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 uh, and, and in another narration Sayyidina Ali says, Ya Rasulullah, shall I fight them until they become like us? I mean Muslims like us. And Islam says, Be steadfast and not rash. Go forth to their area. And call them to Islam, inform them of what is required of them, of Allah's right upon them. And by Allah, if Allah guides one person through you, it is better for you than owning red camels. And red camels are the most expensive uh, wealth, right? The most uh, valuable wealth to, uh, to the Arabs, right? So you see, Rasulullah this, SAW, this line is a very important line. And to always remind yourself of this line, and some says, right, just to guide one person, just one person you guide, right? Either from being a disbeliever to being a believer, or from being a believer that's sinful to being a believer that's uh, practicing, right? Just one person, if you can influence, right, them, that is better for you, right, and the most expensive, right, of wealth, right? So always keep that in mind, right? That even if it is one person. So sometimes that like, you know that like, you see uh, when you when you when you make events, you know, one of my teacher always re- will, will, will remind me when you make you know events, you know, and you, and you organize and whatsoever, right? So even if it's like a very small group of people that actually turn up, right? Just remind yourself, even if it's just one person, <laughs> right? One person will make all of that effort worth it. Right? It will make all of that effort worth it. Right, and understand that it is not us who guides, but it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides. Right? So sometimes people, they look at the, a lot about the physical aspect of things. Right? A lot about the material aspect of things. Right? But sometimes, you know, you want to keep it uh, sincere for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You want, and you want to focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Focus on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Right? So then, you know, then, then you're, not, you're not bothered, you know, by one, two, three, and don't, don't get bothered. And one person, you know, and, and that sincere one person, right, will um, probably be your ticket, inshallah, in the hereafter, right, to paradise. Right? It is said that, you know, uh, and, uh, Muhammad al Fatih, right, the one who actually conquered uh Constantinople and uh and Sham, right, he was a he had a t- teacher, right, who basically he right, was the only student, right? Only one student to that one teacher. Right, but that one student right, went went on and conquered uh, Palestine. Right, and conquered uh, Constantinople, right? So so it's really you know it's clear this hadith is a very strong hadith. It's a very, very strong hadith. And right? sometimes that like, you know uh, even if turnout is, is low and whatsoever just keep reminding yourself, even if it's one person, even if it's one person, right? even if it could be a child, and right, that you affect that, right? and the child from that moment on, right, you know, uh, changes, uh, you know, changes path, right? and then you know, got groups to all and that one person influenced his family and his family and his family, and that's how how baraka works, and right? baraka works like that, right, whereby you don't see the amount of dollars you put in. Right, but you see the sincerity of each dollar. Right, so giving one dollar, right, is could be more worth to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala than billions of dollars. Right, if the one dollar was the sincerity, and Allah was stretched the barakah of the one dollar. Right, same thing with one person. Right, this is just and sometimes you know the uh, sincerity you know, is something that is very difficult, right, to maintain. Right, especially you know uh, in ourselves lah, it's difficult to maintain. Right, so if you keep the sincerity, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will stretch this right, how far and wide and you don't even understand right, how this is this, this all will be. I remember there was I can't remember who was the Sheikh. But there was a Sheikh right in the West, right, who would uh I can't remember the story exactly. Right, but but he 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 was at the, at a gathering Right and during the gathering, right uh, when they were giving a talk something that after the gathering, what three people entered into Islam, right three, right and then uh, and then you know and then the she said to to this ustad who was there, I can't remember, I can't remember who the names really right now, long time ago sorry, <laughs> long long time ago, I said to the, the, the ustad right that uh, that all oh, three people the ustad said to the she the ustad was was a westerner lah. The Shay, oh, three people enter into Islam in our gathering. And the Shay said, No. Right? Thousands will come into Islam from this gathering. Right? Thousands. Right? And then the Ustaz said, You don't understand what the Shay meant. Right? By when he said, You know, thousands will come into Islam. Right? From only three years she came in right, in the gathering. But it's thousands. Right? And then, uh, I can't remember who's this Ustaz who narrated this story. He's an old uh, Western Ustaz. Then he said that. That gathering was a gathering that Shihamda took the Shahada. <laughs> Shihamda was actually there and he took the Shahada in that gathering. Right, so he was one of the three which took the Shahada. <laughs> right, and then she was like, no, thousands took the Shahada. Uh, so of the three, you know, they have like this one person that Allah pushed to the Shahada. Right, and then from him, oh, subhanAllah. For me personally, my, 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 my path changed, influenced by Shihamda. He was the single one person who really influenced and by hearing him every day. And he's all in America. <laughs> I don't know who I am. <laughs> right, but he's in America. And back then, before, you know, uh, internet on the go. <laughs> and years ago, but you had to go online at home and download the MP3s and put it into your MP3 and go to school with your MP3. Right, it's very, it's be, now it's like we have no excuse. Eh? We have like 3G on the go. Back then, it's like no internet on the go. Right, you have to really put stuff in. in it's kind of like you know, uh, cheap. Uh, uh, it's even iPod. Is the is the imitation one? <laughs> it's an imitation iPod. Right, not even the, the real one. <laughs> it's all in there. All like, I think they have like lectures. A lot of like whenever, whenever, whenever I will finish it, I will actually clean it. I will, I will delete it and put new ones because it only has like, like how many megabytes of like you know. You can't even keep so many lectures in there. <laughs> old school lah, right? But really, that that is what it used to be lah. Right, so 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 that's why you know if you if Allah guides just one person, just think that one person, right? Then you know that you, the, the ripple effect, right, will will, will will spread far and 
wide, right? So, and then we will go into the, 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 the trap of doubts. The trap of doubts, they came into Islam very much later on, right? But we'll talk about them, right? Because they came very late, and in fact, they, they had a leader who called them to Islam, right? And then they rejected him. And the tribe rejected the leader who got into Islam. And the leader came with Rasulullah Islam saying, Ya Rasulullah, make dua against them. Right? They, no, they rejected me. And Rasulullah refused to make dua against them. And it was from this tribe, stated on in the story, it was from this tribe that Sayyidina Abu Huraira came from. And the Damara was one of the people of this tribe. And he, so when his tribe became Muslim, he also became Muslim, Sayyidina Abu Huraira. And then from him came all came this like thousands of hadiths. <laughs> right, it's true that. So he so yeah, Abu came in very late, late eh? He's on the eighth or ninth year then he must Islam. Uh, he came into Islam around the eighth year. Right? Very late. He considered very late. What two years he was so long Islam, right? But he by the dua of Rasulullah so Islam, right? He memorized all the hadiths. Because he you can sometimes say, yeah, I don't remember anything that you say. I sit with you and I hear what you say, but I don't remember anything and when the moment I leave. <laughs> and I make dua that Allah uh, give him strong memory and thereafter every single thing that I'm saying, he memorized. Right? And then he would uh, narrate thereafter. And in Sayyidina Abu Hurairah was known to be an old man. He was an old man who was in the masjid, he was homeless. So you don't think of like someone who's like, you know, <laughs> I guess some sort of image of Abu Hurairah in your, in your head. Eh? He's an old man. Uh, he used to be very forgetful. He's homeless, very skinny. Right, he hardly eats, right, very poor, didn't have family, right, the kind of thing, you know, like, right, right, so, uh, but he, the, the, the wealth of knowledge from him, he is the foremost amongst all the Sahaba in Hadith narration, foremost, and nobody, right, comes close to Sayyidina Abu Hurairah in Hadith narration, right, 5,000 plus in Hadith, Sayyidina Abu Hurairah, radiallahu anhu, right, and that's the story of the Bidaw's tribe, right, because the, the, the leader gave up on them, and the said, no, you know, just wait for a while. They come, they come, <laughs> and in that, in fact, in fact, they keep right thereafter. All right. So Sayyidina Ali he goes on, right? Uh, and he split the fourth, right? And the people he's in his tracks until they reach the fourth, right? He, uh, so he put his uh, flag down in a pile of rocks, and the Jew said, "Who are you?" And he says, "I am Ali bin Abi Talib," <coughs> and the Jew said, "You will have the upper hand." Right, the upper hand is basically a word play from the name of Ali, right? Ala uh, Ala It means you will be above. Right? By that was which was revealed to Musa. Alayhi salam. Right? When the people of the fort came to him with their king Marhab, the fighting began. Right? And this Marhab, right, he was a very uh, arrogant person, right? He's a king. Right? And he would go around, you know, and he would you know, swing his sword and he would be very arrogant and he would say, In the Khaybar knows that I am Marhab. A fully armed and experienced warrior burning with zeal when wars come forth. Right? And then, uh, so, so uh, first, uh, Amir, right? The Amir, the, the, the camel singer. Right? Amir, the camel singer. I didn't see his name just now, eh? He's called Amir. Right? The camel singer, right? He, uh, he com- comes up against Marhab, but he was killed. Right? He was killed uh, by Marhab. Then thereafter, uh, but the thing about Amir was that uh, uh, the thing about Amir was that he began to strike Marhab from below, right? but his sword was short. Right? So as he aimed to strike Marhab's leg, the blade returned upon himself and hit him at the top of his own knee, slicing a vein that killed him. Uh, so basically, the, the, the sword that he had fell back onto him. Right? And then people were saying, oh, he's not a martyr, he's not a martyr, he killed himself. Right? And sometimes no, right? He is a martyr. Right? In fact, he was the one who died fighting and striving and very few Arabs have done as what he has done. He has doubled the reward. Right? To show that you know in in in, in war, however they die, right? even if you actually kill yourself in war, which will happen, right? because you're swinging your sword around, right? And you could really come back to you. Right? If it was if you were blocked and your sword came back to you. Right? You could definitely kill yourself right easily. Right, so and but it's not, not to say that you are not a martyr. Right, so, so this marha begins going around and calling out again for people to fight him. Right, uh, uh, in a in a duel. Right, and Rasulullah says, Ali says, I am the one whose mother named Haydara. Right, like the lions of jungle, loathsome in its appearance. I pay the enemy back is due manifold. Right, that's why Sayyidina Ali is called Al Haydara. Right, that is the name of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhum, uh, anhu. Right, and he was said that Sayyidina Ali was named Asad at his birth. Right, his mother called him Asad in a, uh, 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 a lion right, be, uh, after his 
maternal grandfather Asad bin Hisham bin Abdul Manaf but when the father came back uh, Abu Talib came back he changed the name to Ali right so in this marhab she had a dream right that he saw a lion kill him and it was Sayyidina Ali who actually killed him right so Sayyidina Ali uh, uh, killed uh, killed marhab and he was done Right, there are other narrations as to who killed Marhab, but you know, Allahu Alam, right? Uh, most of them actually go with Sayyidina Ali bin Oh killed him. Okay, so therefore, thereafter, right, a lot of uh, the different different battles, right? Uh, so you have the different fortresses being opened up, right, by the uh, by the by the Sahaba, different Sahabas, right, would uh, open up different fortresses. All right. Okay. All right, we're gonna skip. Right, all the way. I'm gonna go through all of the the, the fighting. Right? It's, it's fighting, like I can read through. I can read through. It's fighting, fighting. Right, uh, and the Muslims won eventually. Yeah, all of it. The Muslims eventually, uh, he they won the battles. Right. Okay. So now, uh, Kinana bin Abi al Hukaiq, right, and that is one of the leaders of the Jews. Uh, he sent a message to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, "Should I come down to speak to you?" Right, he wants to have negotiations and a truce. They're trying to figure this out. Right, but Khaybar will be conquered by the Muslims anyway. Right, so anyway, so Sam says yes. So even Abi, Abi al Hukaiq, right, he descended from his fort and he went to meet Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on page 180. Yeah? We're looking for it. Page 180. Alright. So he went to look for Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, uh, uh, and agreed if Rasul sallam upon a truce. That will save the lives of the fighters in the forts and leave them, the children that they may depart Khaybar with them, leaving Rasulullah the property, land, gold, and silver, horses, arms, and clothes, except what they could wear. And right, what they could wear, they'll bring with them. Rasulullah said, And you will be devoid of my protection and worship of Allah if you keep anything from me. Right, and they agreed upon this and they handed the forts to the Muslims. So they eventually they gave up. Right, they actually uh, give in to the Muslims, right, and uh, they would leave with all the stuff. So they don't want to fight anymore. Basically, he surrendered it. Right, it's not even a truth. Eh? Surrender, right? Surrender, right? But on the on the condition that they don't bring anything of their wealth with them, and right? they leave everything behind, right? So this will grant them their, their lives, right, and what their horses and camels could carry, right? And Rasulullah will be the gold, silver, and the weapons, <coughs> right? and then they will go into exile again. Keep exiling them, <laughs> right? So they're going to exile again, right? That was what was uh, agreed. So when Rasulullah was turning the people of Khaybar out of their land, as they agreed, they asked him to allow them to remain so they could work on the land, and that they could receive half of his yield of crops and fruit, right? And they said, "Ya Ras, O Muhammad, let us remain in this land to take care of it, for we know more about it than you, and we'll be able to keep it thriving." Rasulullah and his companions they don't have to work they don't have anyone to work on it so Rasulullah got them the, the, the land of Khaiwa to work on and will give them half of his yield as long as they please him to keep them in it right? so basically they allowed Rasulullah allowed the Jews to stay in Khaiwa to farm the land because they were good at it right? and then he paid them half the yield right? so the land belongs to the Muslims right? but then the Jews because they farm on it they get paid half the yield right, of the land alright so Without any surprise, right, they went against their oath. Right, they went against, <laughs> against every woman over again. <laughs> right, they, 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 they make a promise, they break it. They make a promise, they break it. Right. But Rasul was still given the benefit of doubt, and he was still like, okay, you want to choose in the promise, okay, we make, we make <laughs> in the promises. Right, so it's imagine that, that Kinana with Abi al Hukaik gave his word on behalf of the Jews that they would not conceal anything. From Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and if they did so, they will be absolved of trust and the truth. However, right, besides that, the children of Abu al Hukaik, right? So basically, his uh, siblings, right? So Kinara bin Abi al Hukaik, right? His siblings, right? They themselves hid a leather container filled with money and jewelry that the deceased Huwai bin Akhtab had brought with him to Khaybar when the Bani al Nadir were exiled. So they're not supposed to bring any money with them. So they bring all their gold and silver. Right? And Rasulullah says to them, right, if you hide anything from me, I will know. Right? And then it will break off any of this uh, truce. Right? But they hide. And then they hit and then they... In a sense, you know, you wonder, did they really 
understand he's a prophet. <laughs> I got to try killing him last time round. I had to, to, to throw a rock on his head like time round, and Jibril came and told him to get out of the place. They're gonna kill you, right? And so you know, then <laughs> you wonder. They still keep doing it, eh? right? They still keep as if they. You know, they, they keep forgetting that Allah tells us them everything. Right? They, 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 they can't hide anything. And also, the Hakka of Huwai bin, uh, of, of Sa'ya bin Amr, where is the leather bag of Huwai bin, Al- bin Akhtab? And he said, it was spent on wars and other expenditures. And the Rasul says that it has not been that long and the money was more than what could have been spent. Then he turned him over to, Azub- to Zubair bin Awam and forced him to speak. And so he said, I saw Huye wander around in this abandoned broken down building and they searched the place and they uh, found uh, where they hid the treasure. Okay. And he had the sons killed and their wives and children taken captive and the money divided for breaking their oath. Uh, they broke their oath. So it was that Kinana and his brother Arabia were brought before Rasulullah and Kinana was still newly married to Sophia binti Huye. Right, Sufiya bin Tihuyei, right, she is, so the Huyei, he, he was killed from before, right, but he, uh, he was killed under by another, previously, previously he was killed, right? his daughter is Sufiya bin Tihuyei, right, she is the one who will later on become the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she becomes his wife, right, right now she is the, the daughter, she is, the, she is married, right, to Kinana, who is of the leaders of the Jews, Right, and Kinana will be killed also anyway eventually. Right, so then Rasul will marry Sophia. Right, and he said to them, "Where are the where are your plots that the people of Medina will borrow?" Right, and then uh, he said, "You turn you turn us out of our home and exile us." So we sold them. And he said, "Pay attention to what you say, for if you are concealing anything, I will remove the protection upon your lives and your children." And he said, "Of course, we're not lying." And Allah informed him of where they actually hid everything. Same thing, la, same story. Eh? And Allah informed them and they looked and they looked and they found and he there's some executed them. Right? So one by one la, eh? right? they keep going against their oaths. What's going to be given pots? Huh? pots? It's part of the wealth that's supposed pots to leave behind. Right? Yeah. Part so uh, everything is wealth basically. And it's part of the wealth of the booty of the war. Right? Because they gave up, they surrendered. So basically, whatever is with the enemy army right, is is given to the to the victor, and right? it takes over everything. It doesn't just take anything, right? And because they 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 want to preserve their lives, and they want to to, to be exiled, they want to go off free. So they say, okay, fine, we'll let you off free. We're not killing you, right? But leave everything behind. That was the the agreement. But they kept hiding things, <laughs> and they kept taking things, right? And the result, he knows about it, and then he always persecute them. Right, execute them and then uh, take the family as captives. Right, so when the family was taken as captives, right, that was when uh, Sophia came under the uh, came under the hands of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, so so of course uh, Sukinana he was killed eventually right, because he was found to be treacherous, right, or deceiving unto Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, at this point in the middle of Khaybar, right, with the conquest of Khaybar, so at this point Khaybar has been conquered. Right, it's conquered. The Jews basically they gave up, right, they gave up, uh, and uh, they they surrendered, lah. Right. At this point, Sayyidina Jafar bin Abi Talib and the Ash'aris they came back to uh, uh, to Al Madinah. Uh, Sayyidina Jafar bin Abi Talib, the cousin of Rasulullah Islam, he was all this time in Al Habsha. Right. He was all in, in Ethiopia or Abyssinia. Right and finally the 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 commandment was sent right for them to come back to Al Madina. Right. So they were actually in Abyssinia for a while. Right? And now only in the eighth year they came back. Right. So Rasam was very happy with the coming of, of Haibar. Right. So so we're on page hundred and eighty three. Eh? Jaffa bin Abi Talib came to Rasam and his companions just after they opened the Khaibar. And Rasam had because Rasam had sent a word to the niggas after Hudaybiyah right, to tell them to come back. Right. Because the companions in uh, Ethiopia, right, while Medina was already a place for the Muslims, right, there was still a lot of war going on, a lot of disruption going on. So some said to them, you stay where you are, right, in, uh, in Abyssinia, and stay where you are. Right? Uh, so when the treaty was signed with Daibia, right, and now there is promise right, of peace for some to them to come back to Al-Medina. So they came back, 
And when Rasul when Sayyidina Sayyidina uh, Jaafar came to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? They saw uh, when he saw Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, Sayyidina Jaafar was so, full of so much joy. And it was said that he actually skipped and he hopped like, in a way, like, like in running to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like, he's a cousin of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And uh, Rasul got up and Rasul hugged Sayyidina Jaafar, which is why it's mentioned that. Uh, and he kissed him within his two eyes and he embraced him right and he said that you know it, and which is why whenever you embrace a person especially right in islam akada in the akada islam especially when they return from a trip right from a trip especially from a blessed trip right that you have embraced them and you kiss them in the uh, on your forehead in their eyes right that is of the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam especially when you see them after a long time of not seeing them right so you know, alhamdulillah. Right? So you see, we come back and everything, right? To actually embrace them. Right? It's a sunnah versus Rasulullah law, and um, and ah, uh, huh? why is it weird? Like, I always do it. <laughs> you're so you're so used to the custom of the cheats, and that's not good, right? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> because it's our culture, lah. It's our culture, right? So I mean, if anyone comes back from a trip, just kiss, uh, hug them, and then kiss their forehead, lah. Especially if you go for Umrah, you go for Hajj, you go for something that is righteous. Uh, parents okay? Parents okay, but I mean other people. <laughs> Try. <laughs> right here, right here. Right, if you if you really want to, <laughs> I've done it to my friends. <laughs> One day, okay, you go Umrah, you come back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to pass it to Omar now. I'm going to pass it to Omar again. Alright, so, okay, so, so uh, and he said, I don't know which, help, which made me happier, the opening of Khaybar or the arrival of Ja'far. Sayyidina Ja'far is, adult, is, is the uh, brother of Sayyidina Ali. Right, Sayyidina Ja'far was narrated to be the most alike in looks to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right, but he wouldn't be very long. So in the Jaffa comes in, in in this year, the seventh year, right? Maybe the ninth year he dies in he, he passes away in the battle of uh, Mu'tah. Right, he actually passes away as a martyr right thereafter. Right, so he dies before Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, and they arrived with a lot of gifts from the niggers, right? Uh, uh, and they left them. Uh, so 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 uh, from the of the Jaffa bin Abi Talib who said we went to the niggers. Informed him that we were leaving and he gave us ship, ships loaded with gifts and food. Then he said, Tell your companion what I did. And here are my messengers accompanying you and tell him that I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and that he is Rasulullah. So please ask him to ask forgiveness for me. I said, so When they left him and he was Medina, Rasul met me and embraced me, saying, I don't know which gives me more joy the opening of Khaybar or the conquest of Khaybar or the arrival of Ja'far. Right, then uh, the messenger of the niggers stood and said, Here is Ja'far, ask him for what our companion did for him. Right, and then that is what the niggers has done. Right, and they all oh, forgive the niggers. Right, uh, so this is very uh, clear proof the niggers was, very, was, was indeed Muslim. Eh? If anyone were to ever uh, contend that that is not true, he was actually Muslim. Right, so it, uh, and Salman narrates, and there was a group of Christians that came, right, with Sena Ja'far, and Sena Sena Salman narrates, Causing his words, and when they hear the revelation received by Rasulullah, Sam, you will see their eyes overflowing with tears. Right, it's in, uh, the first part of Juz in Surah Maida, right, the fifth verse, right, and you, know, you will see them, uh, you know, overwhelmed. So I don't know if the eighty-third verse, verse number eighty-three, in Surah Maida. All right. So it, uh, so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, uh, and also of people who arrived for the Ash'ari. Right, the Ash'ari people, like, if you know the, uh, the name Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, I say Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, the, he's one of the main, one of the quite a famous companion, right, actually, Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, right, he is from the Yemen, right, so, uh, Yemen, right, and the Ash'aris are known from the Yemen, right, this is when they actually came, right, they were of the few of the, of, of the, of those communities that actually came to Rasulullah to profess their Islam, right, very early on. Sayyidina Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, right, he is one of those who, uh, he narrates hadith. you find his name here and there in the hadith narration, right. So when they came, 
there is when Rasulullah Sallam said from from afar when he saw them coming, he said, you know, the uh, the Yemenis have come to you, right? They are people of soft heartedness, right? They are they are gentle in their hearts, they are soft heartedness, right? And he says that for surely, uh, iman is Yemeni, right? And hikmah is Yemeni, right? Iman faith is Yemeni, right? And wisdom is Yemeni. It's one of the hadiths that. You know uh, that that uh, from Rasulullah Islam that actually exalt the people of Yemen and right, the Ashari's, right? And then true enough, there were people who were true to the religion even after Rasulullah Alaihi Wasallam uh, passed away, right? And the rest of the peninsula they 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 went against Sayyidina Abu Bakr in giving the zakat. The people of Tarim, right, were the ones who came out of Tarim with the zakat, right? and that's how they earned the dua of Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiAllahu anhu, right? Is that true? That how true they were? Right to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right. So, uh, so here the the, the hadith is here. Rasulullah said to the, the comments for the for the arrival of the Ash'aris, a people will come to you whose hearts are more tender to Islam than yours. And then the Ash'aris arrived. When they arrived in Medina, they began to chant, "Tomorrow we'll meet our beloved ones, Muhammad and his followers." Right. They were the people who loved Rasulullah from the from, from before. Right. Then they met Rasulullah in Khaybar and they gave him their pledge. And he says the Ashari amongst people are like a package in which is musk. Right? They are, you know, they, they beautify right, the people. Right? Another hadith in Abu Hurairah the narrated also said, the people of Yemen come to you with more sensitive and delicate, gentle and responsive hearts. Right? Fiqh or knowledge is Yemen and wisdom is Yemen. Right? So this hadith, this narration says fiqh. Right? Right? Fiqh is Yemen and wisdom is of Yemen. Right? And another uh, narration, it was narrated that the Ash'aris came to Medina, they shook people's hands in greeting, and they were the first to establish a shaking of hands, the salam. Salam using the hands right, is from the Yemenis. Right? They were the first to establish doing that. And the Rasulullah liked it. Right? He liked how they would actually, uh, you know, uh, basically shake hands right? when, 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 when they greet. Right? And the Rasulullah says, the people of Yemen have established the habit of shaking hands amongst you. And he said, one of the signs of completeness of your love for one another is the shaking of hands. Right? And he said in the hadith, that the two people come together and they shake their hands and they salam, shake their hands, then the sins between them will fall. Like the leaves of a tree fall off. Right? So it will actually fall. And much has been narrated about their virtues, uh, a lot about their virtues, eh? uh, including that which um, was narrated on the authority of Abu Musa. There are some says that very the Ash'aris, when they will run out of food in a battle or the food of their families becomes scarce in the city, they will gather all their food together in one garment and then re-divide it between them, even me, in one container. Verily they are of me and I am of them. Right? So, and there are plenty of hadith about the people of Yemen, specifically the Ash'aris. Right? So, the, the, the Ash'aris. Right? Allahu Alam, I'm not sure. <laughs> Where they are descendants of them. Right, but there was basically a lot of the hadiths of people of Yemen come from, from them. Right, they have a, a specific trait about them, right, a, a, a goodness uh, that, that's, that's natural to them. Right, certain communities in the world they have natural good traits, right, that, that's inherent in them. Right, like they will say that the, 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 the Malays they have very you know, natural softness right, in them, that is, and also neighborliness right, that is in them, it's natural right, in them. Right, so when, when Islam came here, right, it was very easy. Right, for them to actually you know, embrace Islam because they already had good characteristics that were already you know manifest in them. Right, same thing like when I was someone was telling me about the Mexicans. Right, Mexicans too, they have like very gentle qualities about them, right, which made them easy to actually embrace Islam. All right, all right. So Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Right, um, uh, Masana Muhammad. <coughs> Alright, this delegation with the Daos, right, basically the entire thing about the delegation was that uh, Tufay bin Amr, right, who was of the people of the Daos, right, he was the one who was sent by Rasulullah to call his people, right? So when he called them, they refused to come. And he refused to become Muslim also anyway, right? He didn't, they didn't want to become Muslim. So he came back to Rasulullah and said, Ya Rasulullah, the Daos is ruined, it has sinned and rejected. I have been beaten by the amusement that follows their fancy and the business of their heart. Right, so pray to Allah against them. Is the hadith that pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala against them, right? And Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him, you know, uh, Ya Allah, guide the daus, <laughs> right? And pray against them. He prayed for them, right? Guide the daus and bring about their return to us, 
I think it's to, to say na, uh, to fail, go back to your people and call them to Islam and be gentle with them, right? So he went back and went called them to Islam and eventually they accepted Islam, right? And they came, right, to Medina to meet Rasulullah Islam. And amongst them, you have Sayyidina Abu Hurairah. Right? So nobody was amongst, it was a Dawsi, right, from the people of Dawus, right? And they came to Rasulullah Alaihi Wasallam. Alhamdulillah, we are close to the end of uh, the, the seventh year. Just this will be two more stories, right, for us to mention, right, and then we will uh, we will end the seventh year, right? Okay. So the two more stories for us to mention is the story of the wedding of Sophia binti Huyay, right, and also uh, the poison meat. And it was given to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These are the main stories, right? And then there are others that if you want to actually, uh, if you want to actually see, right? The Jews were eventually they were exiled right to the peninsula, right? Uh, among in the peninsula, and and basically they they they, they, they thereafter they didn't really uh, plot against Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam anymore, right? It was they were dispersed, right? And they were they were weakened and they were dispersed, and a lot of them actually died off also anyway. Alright, so Sophia binti Huyay. And it was mentioned in the account of death of the two sons of Abu, uh, of Abu al-Huqaiq that Kinana was Sophia binti Huyay's newly wed husband. So when he was killed because he violated the treaty, right, Sophia was taken captive right, and it said that she was taken captive from the fort of Al-Qamus before the Jews agreed to the treaty. So Rasulullah took the, the captives to be collected together they have been Khalifa said to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, give me a woman from the captives, right? And then he said, Go and take one of the Jariya. Jariya is a female, female cap, uh, female prisoner. So he went and he took Sophia bin Tihuye, right? Not knowing who she is. So a man came, right, to the Rasulullah and said that, you know, do uh, you give Dehya Sophia bin Tihuye? And right? she's of a noble woman. Right, of Bani of Bani Qairuda and Bani An Nadir. Right, it's not fitting for her to be a slave, right, for uh, someone like Dehya. You know, it's one a common person. Right. Slave, no, I mean slave so be a, I mean basically a, a woman la. Whether it was a slave or a wife, right, it's a woman. Right. So someone came to him and said some, you, know, you, you can't just give a noble woman to, you know, just what is anybody in among the Sahaba. You know, you know, if anyone was to take her, then it should be you. Right? You should take uh, Sophia, right. That is why the one if you if you continue our sirah past the death of Rasulullah, right, in the battle of the camel, when Sayyidina Aisha's uh, side, right, they were they were tricked into fighting Sayyidina Ali's side, right, and some of them uh, said, you know, we must take the booty, take the booty, mm-hmm. right. And Sayyidina Ali said, no, there is no booty for this battle because it is not a battle, it is a fitna. When Muslims fight, Muslim is called fitna, right? It's not called a ghazwa. Right, it's basically called a fitna, right? And then they said, no, but it's a battle. You know, so we should actually claim booty from them. Then to, to shut them up, so, and then Aisha says, and who will take Aisha as a slave? Right, who? Right. So you're not talking about taking booty, right? Does it make sense? Doesn't make sense, right? Go home. <laughs> and there's no booty in this battle, right? So because of the, the hypocrites, so, and then Aisha said, who are the ones who are like, you know, we need to take their, their wealth from them. You know, we want the battle. Right, but then Ali just retorted by saying, you know, then Aisha, who? Huh? And the other one, right? Who wants to take the mother of the videos as, as a slave? Uh, who, who wants to do that? Right, and no one would dare take Sayyidina Aisha as a slave, right? But here's Sayyidina Sophia uh, from before, right? Uh, because her tribe was captured, right? Uh, that uh, she was taking. So Rasham says, so Rasham says, she was taken as, as a slave. So he says, now bring her to me. Right, so he took her for himself. Right and uh and and Deha was given somebody else, right as a slave, right. So so Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right uh Masayna Muhammad, right uh there was a let me just see I will skip this entire long story here, right. So Rasulullah when he took Sina Sophia, right he presented her with Islam. Right, if she wants, you know she 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 she, she told her if you want I can just set you free. Right, uh, like that, and if you want, you can you can embrace Islam, and I'll marry you. Right, so basically, he gave her a choice. Right, so it's not that she was forced, right, to marry him, but she was given a choice. If you want, I set you free. If you want, I will marry you, but you have to be Muslim, you know. And of course, she chose, 
right to uh, marry Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam and be Muslim, right? So uh, so Rasul presented uh, Islam to her and she accepted. He married her and gave her her freedom as her ma- as a marriage gift, and she said, "I arrived at Rasulullah sallam and he was one of the most despised people to me. He had killed my husband, my father, my people, right? So basically, uh, of the war." And he said to me, O Sophia, I apologize to you for what I have done to your people. Indeed, it is such and such and such to me, and if I turn against me, I turn the Arabs against me and did much more. Right? And then uh, and he began to, you know, speak to her until her feelings were softened. And of course, like, because you lose your family, your father and everything. Uh, you have you still feel you know upset, right? That the Muslims actually uh, killed uh, uh, your your family members, even though she knows, right, that uh there's some is on the truth. Uh, she knows that, right? And it's the non narration says it doesn't say so. Choose for choose if you if you choose Islam, I will keep you for myself. Means I'll marry you. If you choose Judaism, then I'll free you and send you back to your tribe. Right? What do you want? You know, you're free to do, right? And then he says that I he says yeah, Rasulullah, Islam appeals to me, and I have believed in you before you called me to it when I arrived in your camp, and I have no desire for Judaism, and I have no father or brother in it. You give me the choice in disbelief in Islam, for surely Allah and Rasulullah are more beloved to me than my freedom and my my return to my people. So Rasulullah married her, right? And thereafter, he never mentioned her father to her ever again, right? So uh, and it was also mentioned that you know when she was uh, when she was married to Kinana, right? Her previous husband, she had a dream that she saw the moon fall into her lap. Uh, she was the one. she got the dream. Right, when she told her husband the dream, right, the husband interpreted the dream that she has desires for Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, so you see, you desire the king Muhammad, right, and he slapped her and caused a bruise in her eye and also a scar on her face. Right, and that's why when when he came to Rasulullah sallam and Rasulullah asked her what about what's that scar about, she told him that my husband uh, slapped me, right, he hit me, right, uh, to the point that there was a scar that that wouldn't be removed. Because I told him about my dream, and the dream indeed came true. Right, Zainab Sophia. Right, Zainab Sophia. Uh, she was one of those at whom Zainab Aisha was would used to get very jealous over, right? Because she was very beautiful. Right, she was very beautiful. The point Zainab Aisha, she went when Zainab Sophia was first uh, first married or something. Zainab Aisha, she covered herself up, and her face and everything to go and see, right? So that nobody will know that it's her who go and see. Interested lah, who's a new who's a new wife, right? How was she? So when she went, right, she 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 saw, uh, Sina Sophia. She saw that she was so beautiful, right. And then she walked away. Rasul, of course, Rasul can recognize who she is, you know. And says, oh, you know, how do you find her? And then she said, that she's Jewess, like all the other Jewess, you know, Jew, right. And then uh, he doesn't say that for surely she has become a Muslim. Right? And there was once Rasul found her crying because when Aisha called her a Jewess right, again, <laughs> they they have they have like tips back and forth lah. You know, and they're young, right? So you can imagine Sayyidina Aisha. She's she was eighteen when she passed away, right? So she's not, you know, uh, she's just growing up. And she's eighteen, yeah. So at this point, she's sixteen, fifteen, you know, and a lot of jealousy over, over her husband, whatsoever, right? So sometimes people when they when they comment Sayyidina Aisha, right, they don't understand that she's being trained. Uh, she's being trained, and in all due respect to our mothers and Aisha, right? She has she has very very strong jealousy. Right, which is something that she struggled with, right, but she was in, indeed the most beloved uh, of wives to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The most beloved of Sayyidina Khadija, right? So, so when Sayyidina Aisha, you know, said that, uh, that, that said to said to said to um, Sophia, right, that oh, you know, we are Qurayshia, you know, like we are from the Quraysh, we are like we are cousins of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and you are a Jew, right? you are not, you know, you know, you're not one of us, right? And then Sayyidina Sophia cried and then she said Rasulullah said to her, Next time when you see her, tell her, you know, which of you, you know, has her father as Harun, and uncle as Musa, and the husband as Muhammad. And which of you? Because Sayyidina Sophia was from a line of Nabi Harun alayhi salam. And then Sunday his her uncle is Nabi Musa alayhi salam, right? And then her husband is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right. So she uh, she died she was seventeen when she married Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Eh? So they're very near in age, all oh, very near in age. But she was a widow, nonetheless, right? And she was fifty-two when she died. She passed away in during the the time of Sayyidina Muawiyah, right? So, alhamdulillah, 
an issue. And but of course, for them, the, after Rasul passed away, right, there was no more. You know, they, they were they were very close. The wives, and the wives were very close after Sayyidina Rasul passed away. And while he was alive, right, it was all about the husband, lah. You know, like this and that about the husband. Like they they, they have their jealousies, lah, like right, here and there. And they have like their, their camps also, right? So they have Sophia and a few of the wives were in one camp. And they said, Aisha, say in Hafsa, you know, in the other camp, right? So, but, and, but it was not like animosity or anything. It was just like, just do the way they were, right? But after, so in Aisha, when I after some passed away, right, they would sit together in one room, right, being together. Because, you know, basically, none of them can marry again. And they're not allowed to be married, right? So they all sit together in one room and they would remember the days of Rasulullah and stuff. Right, and they would cry, and then they would, uh, you know, uh, basically, they would, they grew close as as women. Right? They grew close after the death of Susan Wong. So they lived for years after his death. Mm-hmm. You know, so now Aisha to the sixties, and and Sayyidina Sophia to the fifties. Right, so you you would imagine them to be very close, right? Because they only, I mean, their mahram would be. Most of them had no children, right? So if they had mahram, it would just be like their brother or their, you know, their their their, their nephews or whosoever. Right, and then besides besides that, they had no one else. Right, you know, in a way, if you can think about it, right, they're in their families. And then Sophia herself, you know, her family, most of them died off. Mm. <laughs> As you can imagine, for her, right, after her passed away, like basically, you know, her support was the people in Medina, right, around the, the Khalifas. And then they spent their days in, in worship, lah, in worship. And then was in Aisha, she was a teacher, right. Uh, so in Hafsa, she preserved the Quran, right. So I mean, they all had their own roles, right, as to what they used to do, right. Okay. And we're going to stop there, inshallah, right? And we're going to end off with the uh, intention of the poison meat. Then uh, next thing on, we're going to speak. We're going to go right into the conquest of Mecca. Right. So, if a Jew became Muslim, is he still is he a Jewish Muslim? Is Jew a race or? Religion? Is a race and a religion. Judaism is a religion. A Jew, right, is uh, is a race. Right, so she's still Jewish by race, right? But not on the religion of Judaism, right? They were they are religion of uh, Islam, right? So I mean, yeah, like, I mean, you don't have to really say that they are they are race if you don't want to, right? Just say that they are Muslim, but the race is there. The race is race.